All right, so uh, hello everyone. Welcome to the weekly seminars of the Department of Cosmic Rays and Chronology at Campina State University. Uh, today we have Mandirata Sen, uh, and the title of his presentation, as you can hear, is going uh, beyond a galactic supernova to hunt for new physics. Uh, Mandirata got his PhD from the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Mumbai, India. Uh, and then he became uh, an three AS fellow at the University of California, Berkeley. And as part of, of the, that fellowship, he uh, was also based at Northwestern University. Uh, he is currently a postdoc at the Max Planck Institute uh, for Nuclear Physics in Heidelberg, Germany. So, uh, uh, thank you for coming. And uh, whenever you're ready, please take it away. Okay, thank you, Guillermo, for the nice invitation. So uh, today I'll be talking about uh, how one can go beyond a galactic supernova to hunt for new physics. The title of my uh, talk is uh, sort of apt out here because the nowadays our hunt for new physics has been sort of dominated by the neutrino sector and we have been doing a lot of hunt within the in terrestrial labs as well. So why not go beyond the terrestrial labs and why not broaden our horizons and go beyond a galactic supernova as well. So uh, to start with, since this is a supernova, to uh, this talk would be dominated by supernova physics. It, might, it will be a good idea to briefly discuss the physics of a core collapse supernova. So uh, right now we're talking about like a type two supernova, which are very massive stars, more than eight uh, or 10 solar masses. And at the end of hydrostatic burning, you're left with a structure that you can see out here, where basically you have concentric shells of different elements, which eventually end with iron at the center. I, it's, it's energetically more difficult to create heavier elements than iron. Now, as more and more elements start converting to iron, the central core starts growing in mass. Up to a point, this core is balanced by the electron degeneracy pressure inside. But at some point, this pressure is overcome. And then the core collapses, which leads to this corresponding implosion. Now, as the implosion keeps on happening, the density of the central core starts increasing. And this roughly leads to a point when the central core reaches nuclear densities. Now, at this point, there is a phase transition. Matter starts becoming stiff. And there is a resistance to the infall of matter. And this leads to a shock wave. Now, conventionally, it is believed that this shock wave is what causes a successful explosion. However, once you run this in a large scale hydrodynamic simulation, in most cases, what you find is that, that this shock wave stalls after a certain point, and then you need some additional mechanism to re-energize this shock wave to cause a successful explosion. It is widely believed that neutrinos, which a large number of neutrinos which are emitted in this process is what causes the shock wave to get re-energized and cause an explosion. So the crux of the mechanism, uh, the bottom line of this whole story is that a huge amount of neutrinos are emitted. These neutrinos are mostly tens of MeV neutrinos, and these are emitted like in huge numbers. If you look at the, uh, the luminosity as a function of time, you can see that the number of neutrinos for, a, if you look at a 10 MeV neutrino, the number can go as large as 10 to the 58 neutrinos per second. And this can go on for tens of seconds and so on. So the point to remember is that almost 99% of the energy of binding energy of the star is emitted in the form of neutrinos. These neutrinos have roughly a thermal spectra. They're not exactly thermal, but it's uh, close to a thermal spectra. I'll talk more about it. And uh, if you can detect these neutrinos, you can get to know a lot, lot about the working machinery of a core collapse supernova. Not only that, these neutrinos travel through very dense matter, which is why they have access to exotic physics, they have access, so it's possible to access very extreme values of exotic properties of neutrinos, which are not otherwise possible to access. In terms of observing neutrinos from a supernova, uh, we have not been very lucky. We have only had one supernova, uh, which happened uh, from which we have observed neutrinos, a galactic supernova. This is the famous 1987, which I'm sure all of you have heard about. And we had, we have observed around 30 events because the detectors at that time were not really prepared. But these 30 events have been used to put some of the tightest bounds on new physics that we know about. So again, the bottom line is that if one can get access to these neutrinos, one can put very tight constraints on exotic properties of neutrinos. So what is the problem? The problem is that a galactic supernova is extremely rare. On an average, if you look at the rate at 
once you go beyond your galaxy, you see that it's it's not so unfortunate because as you broaden your horizon and go to megaparsecs or even gigaparsec scales, the rate of these uh, core collapse supernovae start increasing. In fact, if you go to scales which are of the order of a few gigaparsec, as you can see, uh, the rate becomes as large as one per century. So almost one galactic supernova goes off, one supernova goes off per century as you go to scales of gigaparsecs. Of course, the flux, all these supernovae produce a lot of neutrinos. Of course, as you go further and further off, the flux goes down by a factor of the distance square, and that is not very good. But because you have so many of these supernovae happening at the same time, if you take a combined effect of all the fluxes. So if you take an integrated effect of all the neutrinos from all the supernovae, you might have a possibility of detecting this background. This background is what is known as the relic supernova neutrino background or uh, the diffuse supernova neutrino background. And this basically consists of neutrinos from all possible supernovae that have taken place in the galaxy from the point of, uh, or it's from, from the time of star formation. This can go up to redshifts of the order of six or so, but it's mostly dominated by stars uh, which ha have happened at a redshift of order one. And if one can detect these neutrinos, that, that would basically open up a completely new frontier in neutrino astronomy, because that would actually allow us to do a lot of interesting physics with this sort of ever-present isotropic neutrino background. So how do you estimate this DSNB? The, so in order to calculate the flux of neutrinos from all possible supernova, you would basically need to have a knowledge of three possible ingredients. This has been discussed in a, a lot of details in these two reviews. If you're interested, I invite you to go and look at it. So the basic ingredients of these uh, of the DSNB flux depends on three factors. First, because these neutrinos are traveling from a very large distance, you need to know the underlying cosmology that basically enters into the distance from in which the which the neutrinos travel. This is of course a function of a number of parameters. This might look familiar to some of you. Uh, it's a function of the Hubble parameter and it's a function of the energy densities of different parameters that enter into this. And this of course depends on the underlying cosmology that you're using. Then you need to know the rate at which a core collapse supernova takes off. So this is the rate, uh, this is given by this guy. This is basically a, a product of two functions. One, which is the rate at which stars form and uh, the distribution in which different masses of stars are distributed. I'll go into a more details about these quantities in the next few slides. And of course, you know, some no you have to have some knowledge about the supernova neutrino spectra. This is something that you mostly get from simulations. And uh, once you have all these three informations, you can plug them in into this expression. You can integrate up to the redshift of, of which you would expect star formation to take place. This, as I said, is roughly a number like five or six. You have to keep in mind that the energy with which the neutrinos are emitted are again redshifted. And then you basically get the flux uh, or the spectra of the DSNB for a given flavor. And this is what you have to do. Now let's deconstruct each of these individual ingredients one by one. The underlying cosmology factor, as I said, is quite well known. We have very, very precise data from Planck. And this is what this data looks like. This has again been updated in the 2020 version. And this is more or less well understood. You need to have a good enough information about these parameters and we all know what this is. What is less well known is the star formation rate. So the star formation rate is something that is required to calculate the rate of core collapse supernovae. There is of course an alternative way. You can actually try to measure this rate directly just by trying to observe supernovae going off in the galaxy far off as well and try to see the rate, but that is more difficult. So you usually try to do it indirectly. So the way you do it is you look at stars, uh, the rate at which stars have formed and the rate at which they die. And this is usually used to infer this rate of core collapse supernovae. This Now the star formation rate is a parametric quantity. You basically make observations of stars at different redshifts, and then you get a data that looks somewhat like this. It's all over the place. And then you fit it with a parametric function. So this is the most popular parametric fit that had been used for the first time in these papers. And then it has been kept on, it has been updated continuously. It's basically a broken power law, where as you can see, it goes almost up to a large amount of redshifts, like seven or eight. And uh, there is a linear part, and then there is a break, and then again, there is a decreasing part. So this is, it's parameterized by a function like this, where basically this first part gives you the growth parameter, this linear part, and then you have this guy given by the second guy, and then the third guy. 
and this B and C are quantities which give you, which are basically a function of the redshifts at which these breaks occur. So this is denoted by Z1 and Z2, and these are roughly these two numbers. So this, these parameters are well known up to some uncertainties. This is the table that has been borrowed from this paper. You know these, uh, so this, for example, this is the central value with some upper limit and the lower limit. And this is well known roughly up to a factor of 20 to 30%. Once this fit is known, you also have to know the uh, distribution of stars as a function of their masses. So as you change the masses of stars, how are they distributed? And this again is a very parametric quantity. There are different fits. It's usually believed that it goes as some inverse power of the mass of the star. And the exponent is a number that varies between my uh, one to four. And uh, there is no consensus, but the most popular one that's used is this sulfated distribution, which is basically that this uh, star distribution goes like some power of 2.35 of the masses. And then you convolute this quantity uh, in this and you integrate. The limits of the integration basically go from the lowest mass at which a core collapse supernova can take place. This is typically taken to be around eight or five, eight or nine ish solar masses. You can have supernova going up at smaller masses, but that is not very common. So eight is like the standard value. The upper limit is more hazy. This is roughly the mass at which you expect the star to be so massive that it actually becomes a failed supernova and it collapses into a black hole. So at this stage, we do not want to take information from a failed supernova. So this number is roughly taken to be 50. But as you can see, because this goes as some inverse power of the mass, some square, so this upper limit doesn't really uh, cause a big difference because this is a large number. Now, once you have this information, you can plug everything in and calculate the rate of core collapse supernovae as a function of your redshift. The third ingredient is the one that's the most uh, that's of the most interest to us. It's the neutrino spectra from a core collapse supernovae. Uh, so now this is roughly expected, as I said, to be a thermal spectra. But if you go to simulators and ask them to put all the ingredients in and calculate the spectra, they would tell you that it's not exactly a thermal spectra but it's what's known in the literature as a pinched thermal spectra. What it means is it looks almost like a thermal spectra, except that it has this parameter alpha, which quantifies the deviation from a thermal spectra. So for a neutrino of flavor beta, it's basically given as a function of the average energy of this flavor, which is this quantity E subscript zero, and then a parameter alpha, which gives you the deviation from thermal spectra. You can plot this spectra. Uh, this is what it looks like. So this is the spectra for the new E. This is the spectra for the new E bar. And this is the spectra for the new X. This basically depends mostly, uh, this hierarchy is governed by the hierarchy in the average energies of the neutrinos. The average energy follows the hierarchy of this form. So the new E's have the least average energy, whereas the non-electron flavors, which in this case is something I call new X, so it can be new mu or new tau. They have the maximum average energy. And this is somewhat easy to understand because you're looking at a neutron star. So a neutron star would have a lot of neutrons. So you would have mostly the new E's and the new E bars interacting the most through interaction with neutrons and protons, which is why their average energies is lower than that of the, uh, uh, the non-electron flavor neutrinos. So you know these numbers roughly lie in some ballpark value. You plug these numbers in and then you can plot the spectra. Of course, we know that as the neutrinos travel through the supernova, they undergo a lot of interesting oscillation effects. The, because a supernova is such a dense media, neutrino self-interactions are very important. And this in principle can lead to a collect, what is known as collective neutrino oscillations. Uh, this by itself is a different field altogether. And I do not want to go into the details of this. Uh, it can cause a lot of interesting effects. But in this study, because we are looking at a time integrated spectra, these uh, spectra are kind of similar and we would not consider the, uh, the effects caused by collective neutrino oscillations. So for this entire talk, I would neglect the effects of collective neutrino oscillations. If somebody is interested, I can discuss about this later on. And we only assume that the oscillation effects that the neutrinos undergo are the standard adiabatic MSW transitions, where basically they, it's the matter effect. As the neutrinos undergo, they get a forward scattering potential due to interaction with the matter. And as a result of this, this can lead to a resonant flavor conversion. The crux of this adiabatic MSW conversion is that the neutrinos, which are created as flavored eigenstates deep inside the uh, supernova, because density, matter density is so high, they are almost identical to a mass eigenstate. And the new E is mostly produced as the heaviest neutrino. So as they propagate out, they emit as the heaviest, they are emitted as the heaviest neutrino. 
whereas the non-electron flavor, the new X, they are emitted as the lightest neutrinos. So this is something that I want you to remember because later on in the talk, I would talk about certain new physics scenarios which would question this sort of a picture, that with the, the new E is emitted as the heaviest neutrino and the new X is emitted as the lightest neutrino. So now that we have all these three ingredients, uh, we come back again to this slide. We can plug in the neutrino spectra, we can plug in the rate of core collapse supernovae and the Hubble parameter, and we can calculate the DSNB spectra. So how does the DSNB spectra look like? So on this slide, I show you what the calculated DSNB spectra would look like as a function of energy for the three different flavors. So the orange line shows the new E spectra, the dashed green line shows the new E bar, and this other guy shows the new X spectra. The envelopes that you see are basically the uncertainties that come from the fact that you do not know the rate of core collapse supernova well enough. So as if you remember for the star formation rate, I showed you that there was a central value and there was an upper limit and a lower limit. That envelope is what comes out here. This is roughly a factor of around 40 to 50%. And the other thing that I want you to notice from this is that the new E spectra is sort of different from the new E bar and the new X spectra because these two are kind of close together. And remember, this is an integrated spectra. So you integrate over time for so for each supernova, neutrino emission goes on for around 10 seconds. You take that whole time integrated spectra and then you put it into this and then you integrate over redshift to get this as a function of energy. Now, this spectra looks very nice. It's a very clean spectra. But as with all nice cases, there are a lot of backgrounds which sort of plague this parameter space and make it difficult to, uh, to detect the spectra. So what are the uh, major backgrounds for this uh, sort of a study to keep in mind? So these backgrounds are again flavor specific, so I'll be mostly talking about the main ones. So for new E's, the major background comes from the fact that uh, there are solar neutrinos. So as you can see, the energy lies in the exact ballpark region where solar neutrinos can be there. And this in principle, uh, is a background that can extend all the way up to 20 MeV, which is not a very good idea. But then the good thing is we know exactly where they're coming from. So we can have some directional information to get rid of this background. The other background that you can have are the antineutrinos that come from within the earth. So these come from elements like potassium and thorium and other radioactive elements within the earth. These are mostly low energy neutrinos of the order of four-ish MeV and they lie somewhere out here. This is also something that you can in principle get rid of, but let's not worry about this. The background that forms this new E bar background is the background of new E bars coming from reactor, uh, reactor sites. So most of the experiments that are sensitive, that are trying to detect this would be located close to reactor sites. And this would they would face an, a background of almost 10 MeV coming from reactor antineutrinos. And this background is very difficult to eliminate. And of course, you always have atmospheric neutrinos, which are, uh, which are usually higher energy, but you would have low energy tails of new E and new E bar, which can go all the way up to 30 MeV. So these are the backgrounds that one should keep in mind. And keeping these and trying to reduce these backgrounds is a major goal of all the experiments that are trying to detect the DSNB. The major experiments, the key players in this game are Super Kamiokande, uh, Juno, uh, Juno. Uh, upcoming experiments like Dune, Hyperkamiokande, Thea, uh, and a more fancy experiment like Resnova and others. So all these experiments have some uh, advantages and some disadvantages. In this talk, I would mostly be focusing on the first five ones. I would not talk about Resnova, but uh, we can discuss this later if there are questions. So of this, Super Kamiokande is already trying its best to detect the DSNB spectra. So Super Kamiokande was, had, has, the DS detection of the DSNB as one of its primary goals. And the major channel through which Super Kamiokande detects the DSNB is the inverse beta decay, where basically it tries to catch a new E bar through an inverse beta decay. So it, a new E bar gets captured on a proton, and then that produces a positron and the neutron. The positron can create a Cherenkov signal, which can be detected. And then the neutron basically travels for some time and then gets captured by the hydrogen in the water. And that leads to some extra gamma ray signals. So this had been the major uh, major way of detection of these neutrinos for Super Kamiokande. And Super K was plagued by two major backgrounds. So the first background was that this sort of a signal. So the basic signal that you're looking at, there are two things. The first is you have a prompt signal from the Cherenkov radiation coming from the positron. And then you have a delayed signal coming from this neutron, which gets captured. And this signal can be mimicked by different kinds of other sources. So you can have a spallation background where a cosmic ray muon can hit an oxygen nucleus and produce some other nucleus which decays radioactively. Uh, 
thereby producing a, an electron, for example, super K does not have charge detection capability. And then this can cause a similar signal. Or you can also have a signal coming from invisible muons, which are basically atmospheric neutrinos creating a muon which does not have enough energy to produce a Cherenkov covering. In that case also, it's very difficult to detect, uh, it's very difficult to distinguish this sort of a signal from that of the inverse beta decay signal. Now, how does super -K plan to get uh, rid of these backgrounds? So a very interesting idea was suggested earlier this millennium by in this paper. And the idea is that you dope uh, the water in super K with gadolinium, with some, some compound of gadolinium. The advantage is gadolinium is an excellent, has an excellent neutron capture uh, power. So if you can tag the neutrons that are produced in this process nicely, then basically you can get rid of all these backgrounds. And without going into too much of details, adding this gadolinium can basically get rid of all your spallation backgrounds and can also reduce this invisible muon backgrounds drastically. So the process remains the same. Your new E bar gets captured on a proton, creates a positron which produces a Cherenkov coupling. But then this neutron that gets produced gets immediately captured by the gadolinium. And then that releases some energy, some 8 MeV energy, which is a very distinguishing signal for this process. And the moment you see this, you know that this is a process, this is a reaction that comes from your inverse beta decay process, and you can detect this immediately. So with this, Super Kamyokanda has already, it has started taking data. It has already started, it has, it has done the doping part and it, in principle, it promises to have a positive detection of the DSNB by the end of this decade. So it has already uh, started reaching much of the parameter space. So uh, basically it has reached a large part of uh, this, the large chunk of this parameter space. The SK bounds lie somewhere out here. But then it promises that by the end of this decade, it would basically reach a place where it can, in principle, detect the DSNB. So we should expect that by the end of this decade, we would have a positive signal from this experiment. So while this is quite uh, convincing and optimistic, it now helps to think, go one step beyond and think of more futuristic experiments, which are larger scale versions, and which would basically build on the success of Super K to have a more convincing detection of the DSNB with even larger statistic events. So there are two steps to it. First, Super Kamiokande detects signal from the DSNB. And second, you build more larger experiments, which would basically have large, high statistic signals from this uh, spectra and then one can use this high statistic signals to do to probe fundamental physics so one such example is the hyper kamiokande which is basically like a bigger brother version of super k it's a 10 times bigger version and this in principle would have an excellent sensitivity to the dsnb and can get rid of uh, backgrounds in, in and has a good background control as well the other experiment that is very interesting and that's still in a proposed form is this experiment called thea this is basically an experiment that has been proposed to be uh, put in the new near detector for Dune. Uh, it will be one of the modules of the near detector for Dune. And the advantage for this experiment is that it is uh, it uses something called a water-based liquid scintillator. So what it does is it can, takes water and then adds to it some fraction of organic compounds so that it adds like a scint scintillator as well. So it basically uses the best of both worlds. So it has water, which basically can detect events through inverse beta decay Cherenkov radiation. And then it, the scintillators, uh, scintillator compounds in the water can also give you an excellent uh, energy resolution that comes with scintillator elements. So you have the advantage of low energy resolution that a scintillator provides and a very good energy reconstruction technique that a Cherenkov detector provides. So with this sort of an experiment, you can actually use to, you can use this to reduce background drastically because you can do something like you can look at the amount of number of Cherenkov rings that are formed and take a ratio to the amount of scintillation light that has been produced. And then you can use this sort of a ratio to get rid of a lot of backgrounds. So these will be two of the major experiments. These are futuristic. They would be like the next generation experiments. And these would be two experiments that I would talk about uh, that I would use to uh, study new physics prospects from the DSMB. So with this, uh, the broad question that we want to ask is, let's say we have detected the DSNB, we have access to quite a few events, then what are the kind of uh, searches that we can do? So can we use the DSNB as a late universe laboratory? As I'll try to convince you in this talk, 
there is a multidisciplinary aspect uh, to understanding these supernova neutrinos. You can use this to probe a number of topics in particle physics, particularly for neutrino properties, which is going to be the main focus of this talk. But not only that, as I told you, it also depends on the underlying astrophysics through the star formation rate and the rate of core collapse supernova, as well as the underlying cosmology through the Hubble function. So you also, knowing any of the parameters allow you to have very good information on the other parameters, and you can in principle use it to probe these parameters as well. Overall, there is a huge multi-messenger aspect to detecting the DSNB. And uh, I hope by the end of this talk, I'll be able to convince you that with this, we will be opening up a totally new window to multi-messenger astrophysics. So let's start. So as I said, I will be discussing some properties of neutrinos, ex exotic properties, so which are known as BSM properties of neutrinos, which in principle can be probed with uh, future detection of the DSNB. So I'll start with uh, properties which are easily probed, where the prospects are very high, where in principle, a detection would immediately allow you to put super tight constraints on these properties. And uh, towards the end of this talk, I would talk about more futuristic probes, which are not super optimistic right now, but then with uh, better technologies, one can actually probe these exotic scenarios. And in those cases, that would be like the only way to you to probe these scenarios would be through a DSNB. You would not have any other options. So let's start with neutrino decays. So the first thing to understand is that massive neutrinos can always decay to lighter ones, even within the standard model. So even within the standard model, you can have a process like this, where let's say a new two can decay to a new one through a loop diagram of this process. And you can calculate the rate of this decay. And what you would find out is that the lifetime of this decay is longer than the age of the universe. It's a very, very long decay. So this is not helpful. But this need not be the case once you start introducing new particles. So for example, one of the simplest models is that you can postulate that there is a very light scalar, uh, which couples to your active neutrinos. And if the scalar is light enough, then your heavy neutrino can decay into a light neutrino and the scalar. And depending on the helicity of the daughter particle that is produced, this decay can either conserve the helicity, in which case the daughter and the parent have the same helicity, or it can be a helicity flipping decay, in which case they have opposite helicity. This is uh, uh, just a subtle point, and this is useful because uh, depending on what is the helicity of the daughter particle, the energy distribution of the daughter particle also changes. So how does neutrino decay happen? So now let us get back to the point where which I discussed that for adiabatic MSW mechanism, the new, new E's are produced as the heaviest neutrino. So let's work in the normal ordering. In the normal ordering, which is this ordering, the heaviest neutrino is given by the new three mass eigenstate. So let's say the new E is produced. And I if I work in a scenario where there is no neutrino decay, the new E basically comes out of the supernova as a new three. That's the heaviest eigenstate for the new for normal ordering. And if there is no decay, the new three, because it travels a long distance as a mass eigenstate, it's perfectly fine. It reaches the Earth. At the Earth, you want to detect the fraction of new E that is there in the new three. And this fraction is given by nothing else than the PMNS uh, element UE3 square, which is basically, if you forget the new X component, it's just a small number, which is like 2% of the initial new 3 flux. This is just because UE3 square is a tiny number. It's just like 0 0.02 given by the tiny value of sine square theta 1, 3. So this is what you would expect in the standard scenario of no decay. There is, of course, a contribution coming from the, uh, the other mass eigenstates, the new 1 and new 2, but they remain the same. Let's only worry about this. So the new E would just be detected as some 2% of the initial new 3 flux. However, let's imagine a scenario where the new three decays now to a new one particle. So the new E comes out as a new three and en route towards the earth, the new three decays into a new one. Then the fraction of new E that you detect is not given by UE three square, but it's given by UE one square, which is the one one element of the PMNS matrix. And this is a big number. This is like 70% of the initial new E flux. And as you can see, if this sort of a decay happens, of course, this is the best case scenario, you would get a huge enhancement of flux from a 2% enhancement, from a 2% to a 70% enhancement. So, for, so in this case, you would expect a huge enhancement in your DSNB spectra. The same argument holds for uh, inverted ordering. 
where you can convince yourself that you would see a suppression of spectra instead of an enhancement because you would now in that in an inverted ordering the heaviest state would be the new two and then the new two can for example decay to a new three and then instead of ue2 square you would basically get a ue3 square so you get a huge suppression so you can use this sort of an argument to put constraints on the neutrino lifetime this is exactly what we do out here so we take the best case scenario. There are also other scenarios which are here in this paper, but for demonstration, I'll only show you the best case scenario. So you see a scenario where the new three decays to a new one, and you consider Majorana neutrinos. The advantage is that for Majorana neutrinos, when you look at a helicity flipping decay, which is where a left guy decays to a right guy, the right neutrino basically acts as the anti-neutrino. So in this case, detectors like Theia and Hyper-K would see if you are in the normal ordering, a huge enhancement of events. This is what you see out here. So I show you the events per bin per 10 years as a function of energy. The blue line shows you the prediction that you would get in absence of decay. Now, as you allow the neutrinos to decay, remember the new three would go to a new one by this picture, and then you would expect a huge enhancement in events. And this is exactly what you see. The blue line starts changing into the colored lines. And for some lifetimes, the enhancement can be quite large, as you can see. And even for Thea, you see the same thing. And this, in principle, allows you to set limits on the lifetime that uh, you can you can basically use the DSNB to set limits on the lifetime. And the values of lifetime that you're sensitive to are pretty long. They're longer than most of the bounds that you can get from other sources. So as you can, I don't know if you can see these numbers, these numbers are of the order of 10 to the 9 seconds per EV or 10 to the 10 seconds per EV, which are very large numbers. So you can do your statistical analysis, you can take the null hypothesis that your neutrinos do not decay, and then you allow your neutrino to decay, and you would see that, for example, hypercamiokande can probe lifetimes of the order of 10 to the 9 seconds per EV with almost a significance greater than 2 sigma. And this, of course, it might not seem like a large significance, but that is simply because you're plagued by uncertainties of your star formation. So in these analysis, we always take a 40% uncertainty that we do not understand the star formation rate. Of course, in future, we would have a better measurement of the star formation rate, and this number can go up drastically. It can even reach like the desired larger sigma limits. The point to note is that this limit of 10 to the 9 seconds on the lifetime is probably the longest that you can get. It's comparable or even larger than the limits that you set from cosmology, uh, for example, and other sources are far, far below. So for example, from the sun, the bounds that you would get are of the order of 10 to the minus three or minus five seconds. Uh, if you take long baseline experiments, the baselines are actually short. So you get bounds of the order of 10 to the minus 10 seconds and so on. Cosmology bounds are different. They can be uh, comparable. But there have been some recent studies which have questioned this bound and this number has actually gone down. The, the main reason why you get sensitivity to such a long lifetime is that because the neutrinos are coming from a very, very large long distance. They're coming from the point of star formation and, you, this, and you're measuring an integrated effect of all the neutrinos that are coming from distances of gigaparsecs. So because you're sensitive to such long distances, you're correspondingly sensitive to such long lifetimes. And this is what makes it so unique out here, that the DSNB basically provides you a naturally long baseline. So any kind of experiment that is sensitive to physics over long baselines would basically be, can basically be tested by a detection of the DSNB. So the first one in this case was the neutrino decay. So neutrino decays are of course sensitive to lifetimes, which is why solar bounds, for example, are so much better than long baseline experiment bounds. And so even supernova bounds would be like of the order of 10 to the five seconds, but that's for a galactic supernova. But then if you take supernovae from all possible uh, point of star formation, you're basically sensitive to distances which are of the order of gigaparsecs. And then you, in principle, you can probe lifetimes like 10 to the nine seconds per EV. And this till date would be like the strongest bounds that you can set on neutrino lifetime. So the second effect now, this concludes the first effect that I was talking about. Uh, the second effect that I would be talking about concerns uh, something, a topic called pseudo Dirac neutrinos, which also in the literature is known as quasi Dirac neutrinos. And as you can understand from the picture, it, it corresponds to oscillations of neutrinos. So let's try to see what are these pseudo Dirac neutrinos. So uh, to understand pseudo Dirac neutrinos, uh, 
let's go back let's take a step back and try to understand the mechanism of neutrinos getting mass so one of the simplest ways of giving neutrinos masses is to add right handed neutrinos that i think we all agree so we add right handed neutrinos to a lagrangian let's take three right handed neutrinos and then of course we know that if a uh, lepton number is not taken to be a symmetry of your theory these right handed neutrinos can have majorana mass terms so after electroweak symmetry breaking the most generic majorana mass matrix would look somewhat like this you would have uh, an off diagonal dirac mass term and then you would have a diagonal majorana mass term now this can remind you of the standard seesaw mechanism where after this step we go to the limit where these right handed neutrinos are extremely heavy and this basically allows you to diagonalize your mass matrix and get your usual seesaw mechanism the question that we want to ask out here is that what happens if you go to the opposite limit what happens if you go to the limit where the right handed neutrinos are not as heavy as the uh, usual as the left handed or the active neutrinos so this is the pseudo dirac limit where basically the diagonal elements are much much smaller than the off diagonal elements in terms of a physical picture this corresponds to the question that uh whether lepton number is really very strongly violated or is it softly violated so if this number is tiny then basically what it means is that lepton number is very softly violated in the system so in this limit so this is basically a 6 by 6 matrix so you have these individually these are these can be 3 by 3 matrices in this limit the 6 by 6 matrix can be diagonalized as it was shown in this paper this is a very nice paper it gives you a very detailed description of how to diagonalize this matrix and what it was shown is that you can diagonalize this matrix in a way that uh, after diagonalization your effective 6 by 6 neutrino picture looks somewhat like this so what is this picture what happens is because your right handed neutrinos which are of course are sterile neutrinos are not so heavy after diagonalization uh, you basically have a scenario where these sterile counterparts come very close to your active counterparts in other words the mass square difference between the active and the sterile neutrinos are extremely tiny and are mostly give, and are given by a scale that is set by this tiny number what this means is that the three neutrino picture that you saw before basically splits into this picture where each of these states have a corresponding sterile counterpart so for each active neutrino you would have a sterile neutrino uh, with a mass square difference that is very very tiny given by this tiny quantity out here and you can diagonalize it and show that your active flavor state is basically a maximal linear combination of a sterile mass state and an active mass state given by the standard pmns matrix now this picture is very interesting because what it tells you is that instead of the usual seesaw picture where the right handed neutrinos are far beyond your active neutrinos in this case your right handed or your sterile neutrinos are almost degenerate in mass with your active neutrinos as you can see in this picture that obviously implies that now you have an extra oscillation scale in your theory right so for previously what you would have is you would have oscillations driven by this atmospheric mass square difference which is the difference between the nu3 and the nu2 or the solar mass square difference which is the difference between the nu2 and the nu1 but now you can also have active sterile oscillations driven by this delta m square which are just oscillations between these two states or these two states this would basically convert an active state into a sterile state with an oscillation frequency which is governed by this tiny delta m square now the you might think at first that this can immediately be ruled out because for example in the early universe you can populate a lot of sterile neutrinos and thermalize them and then then what do we do but the fact is this tiny delta m square only allows the sterile neutrinos to be populated over length scales which are inverse of this uh, delta m square so what this means is that for most terrestrial experiments uh, the oscillation length scale is so large that this does not even allow you to have enough time for sterile neutrinos to form so this sort of active sterile oscillations driven by a very tiny delta m square will only will only be possible over very very long base lengths because it's basically inversely proportional to this delta m square so there have been studies on this pseudo dirac picture uh, as you can see in these cases and you can basically use it to probe delta m squares which are as tiny as 10 to the minus 12 ev square or so on so for example the sun quite far off so you can in principle have oscillations driven by a tiny delta m square of this value 
The point again is that the DSNB allows you to have access to much larger distances. So you, in principle, you would be sensitive to much tinier values of delta m square. So the point. So if you want to calculate the DSNB and incorporate these oscillations, you would basically be sensitive to oscillations happening over a length scale that are of the order of gigaparsec. So that is exactly what you find out here. So you calculate the, your standard oscillation probability of obtaining a given flavor from another flavor. And what you see is that there are three effects. The oscillations due to the solar and the atmospheric mass square differences get averaged out due to the long baselines that are there. However, you would have an active sterile oscillation driven by this tiny delta m square. And this active sterile probability or the probability of obtaining an active neutrino after traveling a distance L can be computed to look like this. So this is very similar to your standard oscillation probability. So if you set this red term to one, you basically get a term that looks like one plus cosine, which is your sine square, and you get your standard oscillation probability. But what you see is that you also get an additional term, which causes an exponential damping out here with a different length scale. So there are two length scales in your problem. There is, of course, the standard oscillation length scale, which is something that we all know from standard of neutrino oscillations, which is this inversely proportional to delta m square. But you also have a length scale, which tells you that, uh, which is basically known as the coherence length scale. So what happens is that as neutrinos travel over very long distances, because they have finite masses, they also have finite velocities. And the wave packets basically start separating. They do not overlap. And this causes a decoherence. So once neutrinos travel over very long distances, these their wave packets cease to overlap. And this causes the oscillations to die down. And this is basically given by this exponential damping factor. This tells you that if you travel distances longer than the coherence length, uh, then uh, basically this factor becomes quite large and this kills the entire damping term. So you, you just get a factor of half and the coherence is set in. Uh, this coherence length, of course, depends on two factors. It depends on the delta m square, but it also depends on the width of the wave packet. So the longer is the width of the wave packet, the bigger would be your coherence length. The more difficult it will it be to make the oscillations uh, cease to happen. A naive calculation for energies of the order of 10 MeV will tell you that the oscillation length, uh, if you are sensitive to an oscillation length of around 10 gigaparsec, then you would be sensitive to a delta M squared of the order of 10 to the minus 25 EV squared. On the other hand, the coherence length for the same values would be like hundreds of gigaparsec, so it's quite safe. So this means that for these DSNB neutrinos, if your lepton number is actually softly violated, you would actually have very rapid oscillations for with values governed by such tiny values of delta m square. This is what I show out here for one of these flavors. So in absence of these oscillations, this the spectra looks like this nice smooth green line, which is what you've seen before also. But the moment you switch on an oscillation driven by these tiny delta m square, you start seeing very rapid oscillations in the spectra. So for example, for a value which is like 10 to the minus 25 EV square, you see these blue rapid oscillations. And as you start increasing delta M square, the oscillations become more rapid, but your spectra also goes down by a factor of half. It's again a combination of two factors. So once you start increasing your delta M square, your coherence length decreases, and then you're again more susceptible to decoherence. So it's an interplay of these two factors that you would be sensitive to. So these neutrinos that are traveling over long distances would have oscillations. And of course, due to finite energy resolution of the detector, these oscillations would be averaged out, but this would cause a distortion in your spectra. And this distortion would be visible. And in principle, this sort of a effect can be utilized to put very tight constraints on how tiny this value of delta M square can be. And Let's skip this slide. I've already discussed this. And this is exactly what uh, we try to do out here. We ask the question that, let's say I have a certain width of the wave packet, which is something that is an external input. And then I ask the question to what values of delta M square are my experiments sensitive to? The, as we did in this naive calculation before this one, we, we see that the delta M square that you're mostly sensitive to uh, lies around the ballpark value of 10 to the minus 25 EV square. And this is exactly what we get. So let's focus on this blue curve, which is for a width of the wave packet, which is large enough that decoherence is not important. So for example, you can see super Kamiokande can basically probe values of the order of 10 to the minus 25 EV square with a significance, which is almost larger than three sigma. On the other hand, futuristic experiments like hyper -Kea -Kea 
would actually have more than a five sigma sensitivity to these values of delta m square. And these are, mind you, extremely tiny values. This would be the tiniest value of delta m square that can be constrained with the detection of the DSMB. And this is summarized in this sort of a plot, which basically shows the landscape of neutrino experiments. So on the y-axis, you have the different energies of the neutrinos that different experiments are sensitive to. On the x-axis, you have the different baselines that different neutrino experiments are sensitive to. And these dashed lines are just are the logarithms of the delta m square that different neutrino oscillation experiments can probe. So for example, this red dashed line is the solar delta m square. This other one is the atmospheric delta m square. And for different neutrino oscillation, so for example, if you're looking at neutrino atmospheric neutrino oscillation experiments, they roughly lie in this ballpark value with energies of the order of hundreds of GeVs and baselines of the order of hundreds of kilometers. Accelerator neutrinos lie here, reactor neutrinos lie here. And what you see is that the DSNB can in principle probe values of delta M square, which are as tiny as this value, 10 to the minus 25 EV square. This is the tiniest value that can be probed so far. With 1987A, you can probe a value of the order of 10 to the minus 19 EV square, which is also something that uh, you can calculate. You can also use high energy neutrinos that have been observed from blazars to put some constraints on these values. But none of these values compared to the values that you get from DSNB. Again, and this comes out because the baselines that are offered are much, much larger than any of these other baselines. So this concludes the, uh, so how much time do I have left? This would be the last part of my talk. Uh, shall I continue? I, I think seven minutes or, okay. or okay. 10 minutes or 15. Or okay, that, that should be fine, yeah. So this last part of the talk is more speculative. And uh, to be honest, the prospects of uh, detection are much more difficult in this, but let me anyway go through the idea. And this uh, concerns the origin of neutrino masses. So uh, we all know that neutrinos have a finite mass and they oscillate, but the question is, when does the neutrino mass get origin? When does the neutrino mass originate? When does the neutrino mass get generated? So or can the neutrino mass be redshift, uh, redshift dependent? This is not a new question. This is a question that has been probed for quite some time since the last decade. And this uh, work, these couple of works that came out in the last couple of years have given more impetus to this question. So the question comes from the fact that in some sense, the earliest measurement of neutrino mass that we have done till date are that from solar neutrinos. So solar neutrinos tell us that neutrinos can oscillate and that, that's why we know that neutrinos have masses. If we go to neutrinos that are earlier than the solar neutrinos, we actually have do not, we do not have any consistent probe of neutrino masses. In fact, lambda CDM cosmology by itself is completely consistent with massless neutrinos. It's only when you put in the masses of neutrinos as an additional parameter that you can put constraints, but these constraints also do not rule out zero masses of the neutrinos. They only put an upper limit to what the masses of the neutrinos can be. And this is what these people did out here. They did a redshift dependent parameterization of neutrino masses. So they considered neutrino mass as a function of redshift and use all possible cosmological data that they have. They had they use data from CMB temperature, polarization, lensing, and so on. Then they use data from various acoustic oscillations, type one supernovae data, and so on. And then they try to reconstruct this uh, sum over neutrino masses as a function of redshift. And this is what they found. It's pretty interesting. What they found is that if you, uh, if you are in Intermediate redshifts, the bound is quite strong. It's consistent with the bound that is quoted nowadays in the literature. But if you go to lower redshifts, then the bound actually loosens out a lot. So for example, for, if, uh, if for redshifts between 0.1 and 1, the neutrino mass sum, sum over neutrino mass bounds can be as large as 1 EV or something. And this in principle, they, they say that this can be accommodated in models where the neutrino mass can be generated at low redshifts due to you know, some non-standard cosmology, some phase transition or coupling to scalars. So the question that we wanted to ask out here is that if this is indeed the scenario, if the neutrino mass is redshift dependent and it based, so the neutrinos remain massless up to a quite certain time in the late universe, and then their masses switch, switches on at a certain redshift, 
apart from cosmology is there any other probe that you can do for this scenario so cosmology again can only tell you that the neutrino mass can in principle be zero for a certain case but then it can never really put the neutrino masses to be non zero it only puts an upper limit the question is if neutrino masses are indeed zero up to a certain redshift and then it switches on what are the different ways that you can probe it and this is where the dsnb comes into play because the dsnb basically consists of neutrinos from redshifts of the order of 6 or something so it basically probes neutrinos from a redshift like 6 up till current day so it it is sensitive to whether the neutrinos are massive or massless because that also governs the kind of flavor conversions that neutrinos undergo and that governs the amount of uh, a certain flavor that you would see at the earth and this is a kind of study that we wanted to do in this work we stay agnostic of how the mass generate is generated and we treat the neutrino mass as some parametric form like this so zs is basically a redshift at which the neutrino mass switches on so for any redshift greater than zs the neutrino mass is almost zero because the denominator dominates for redshift smaller than zs the neutrino mass is what we see now our, observe nowadays so let's say the bound given by catherine so, and this transition can in principle be a sharp transition or it can be a weak transition. There is not much bound on this, but this would be a parametric form like this. So for example, if you look at this plot, it shows you this quantity m nu as a function of redshift. And you can see for different epochs of mass generation, which is given in this colors, the neutrino masses can switch on at different times like this. So for example, if we take this value at 0.1, then for any redshift greater than 0.1 neutrinos are massless. For any redshifts less than 0.1, they reach their current day mass. And the question is, if this sort of a scenario is indeed present in the early universe, how would this affect the DSNB? So schematically, how does this picture affect the DSNB? So let's try to see. So this cartoon out here shows three different supernovae at three different redshifts, and there are neutrinos that travel towards the Earth. So the red basically indicates, so this is the x-axis indicates the redshift. Zs is when the neutrinos get a finite mass. Any redshift below Zs, the neutrinos are massless. This is denoted by red colored. And after Zs, all the neutrinos become massive. And this is denoted by green colors. So let's take the first supernova, which is at a redshift, which is much smaller, much larger than Zs. In this case, the neutrinos are massless by our previous uh, model. So whatever is produced inside, they're just massless neutrinos, right? So for massless neutrinos, the propagation, or let's not consider them massless, but they're very, very tiny massive mass neutrinos. So almost massless. So for these neutrinos, the propagation is almost non-adiabatic. So then this picture where the new E is emitted as a new three does not remain the same because that relies on adiabatic propagation. If it's non-adiabatic, there are these hopping probabilities that come into play, which basically means that the other eigenstates also get uh, populated. So then the neutrinos that come out, they're not just the new E's are not just new three, but there are also non-trivial contributions of the new one and new two. This you can see from this expression, which is the most general expression. And PCs are basically the hopping probability due to non-adiabaticity. So if your evolution is adiabatic, all these PCs are zero, which means that the first two combinations die down, and then you are only left with U3, which is the standard scenario. But if it's non-adiabatic, then these combinations are also non-zero, which means that the new E flux that you receive at the Earth is larger than what you would expect if the neutrinos were massive for this supernova. For the second guy, this guy lies at the border when the neutrino mass switches on, so what happens is that the neutrinos propagate as massless and at some point its mass switches on. So for some cases, these values would be zero. So it would still be larger than what you would expect if PC were zero. The third case is all neutrinos are massive and this is the standard case where PC is zero and you only receive new three. The crux is that depending on where the supernova takes place and at that point, if your neutrino is massless, the flavor that you receive at the Earth can be actually larger than what you would expect if your neutrino was massive. And this is what we want to study in more details. So in order to understand that, we need to solve the neutrino propagation inside a supernova. One can do that. And as a function of redshift, let's say I want to calculate, I want to see how the survival probability looks like at a given energy. And this has this very nice looking form. And we want to understand this behavior numerically. 
So if the neutrino mass switches on while the neutrino was in vacuum, the propagation would be very similar to vacuum. So the survival probability would just be given by an expression like this, which sums up to 0.57. And this is exactly what you see out here. On the other hand, if the neutrino masses were already there, what you would have is your standard MSW propagation. And in this case, if you're in normal ordering, you are just, this is the same number that I showed you before, you just get 0 0.02. So what you get out here is that you get a large enhancement. So you get an enhancement from for normal ordering from 0 0.02 to almost 0 0.57. And this is the enhancement that you want to be sensitive to. Again, I would not go into the details of everything, but then let's focus on this plot out here. The red line basically shows you the standard prediction of the neutrinos. And then if the neutrinos were massless, the same prediction would be given by this red dashed line if they were massless throughout which is of course not true because we know now that neutrinos are masses. They have masses. So in the extreme scenario, if the neutrinos would have been massless throughout, then you would get a huge enhancement because the propagation would have been non-adiabatic throughout. But then if you allow the neutrino mass to switch on at some redshift between one and zero, then you see the propagation, start, the, the flux starts increasing. And at some point it can even go above this uh, star formation rate uncertainty band. And this in principle can allow you to actually probe uh, at, as to what redshift the neutrino mass switches on. And this might be one of the very few ways in which you can probe uh, a non-zero mass of the neutrino at a given redshift. You can do a similar game by varying the mixing angles, but for lack of time, I would not go into the details. And let me come to the last slide, which is uh, where if, you, if this effect were true, what sort of an effect can you expect in a detector like Dune? So the effect that you would see as I said, this is still very optimistic. So the red line is what a detector like Dune would expect in the standard scenario where neutrino masses would neutrinos would be massive throughout. But then once neutrinos are massless up to a certain time, and then you switch on a non-zero mass, this number can actually go from here to this green line also. I mean, in some cases, as you can see, this actually goes below the star formation rate uncertainty band. So if the star formation rate uncertainty band were smaller, then in principle, you can actually see a decline in these events. And then uh, this can point to a scenario where neutrino masses switched on at a later redshift. And this would be basically the only way to test this scenario where neutrinos would be masses, massless till the late universe. And then its mass can switch on due to some unknown cosmological mechanism that we do not know about. So this brings me to the end of the talk. So uh, I have only discussed uh, a couple of scenarios out here. There are more uh, scenarios that can be discussed, but the basic idea is that once the diffuse supernova background is detected, it can open up a plethora of avenues for neutrino physics. And in terms of multi-messenger astronomy, this would be the next giant leap from solar neutrinos and supernova 1987A neutrinos. The advantage that we get is that we do not have to wait for a lifetime to see these neutrinos from a, from a galactic supernova. This is just around the corner and with super K taking data, we can expect a detection in the next 10 years. And once we detect this, the spectra can be used to test extreme properties of neutrinos. These are exotic properties, which are dependent on these neutrinos having very long baselines. And this sort of properties cannot be tested otherwise in any earth-based experiments. In fact, as I showed you, our future detection can provide, uh, can give you some, uh, constraints on neutrino properties, but you can actually turn this question around and put constraints on uh, the expansion of the universe. For example, you can use it to put constraints on the Hubble parameter or on the star formation rate. And these are things that I did not discuss out here today. And there are also other things that I did not discuss, but I would be happy to talk more about it if anyone asks that you can put constraints on what fraction of a supernova can form into a black hole, or if there are alternate cosmological models and so on. All in all, the Conclusion is that with a detection of the DSNB in the next decade, we would have a lot of interesting avenues to explore for neutrino physics. And with this, I'll conclude. All right. Thank you very much, Mirata. Uh, questions? Anyone? See? Well, I, I have one question. Yes, go ahead. So many brat, uh, when uh, it's about the the neutrino masses that change with redshift. Mm -hmm. so, uh, to in order to do this, you assume, for example, that m m one is zero. Let's say for normal watering, m one is zero, and then you say that m two and m three will gain mass that depends on redshift. 
and with and these you change the delta m square something so, like that. Yes, but we don't put anything to zero. So the, the simplest variation is you assume that all the three masses of them are uh, non-zero with the constraint that the delta M square is respected at the present scenario. So yeah. then these masses basically switch on, uh, they follow this sort of a functional form. And as this masses changes, the delta M square of course also changes. And then you can plug this into your uh, into your Hamiltonian and solve for the oscillation probability. And this is what you would get, for example, in this plot. I see. Yeah, and when, okay. And with delta M square changing, you change also the adiabaticity parameter. Exactly. And exactly. So for very low masses, the adiabaticity parameter, it's non-adiabatic, which means that these hopping probabilities start kicking in. And then your new E for normal ordering is not just UE3 squared times the initial flux, but you also have these other non-trivial contributions as well. And that increases your flux. Okay, uh, this is very interesting. And you have any idea of the theory that would generate this kind of thing? Yes. So uh, the first paper that I saw, so there are uh, papers of mass varying neutrinos that was that have been there for quite some time, like early two thousands. But uh, the the paper that basically did this sort of an analysis was this paper where they basically say that there is some sort of a phase transition in the late universe due to so there is a vacuum, but that vacuum is not the true vacuum of the universe, and that vacuum at some point decays to your true vacuum and dumps some energy into the neutrino sector. So the neutrinos are massless till the point that the false vacuum decays. And this can be like less than an EV temperature. And when the false vacuum decays, it dumps energy into the neutrino sector and makes it massive. So that would basically lead to such a kind of a scenario. Okay. Yeah. It's, and it's a very exotic scenario, but it, it in principle is allowed by cosmology as this follow-up papers showed. Okay. Yeah, okay, nice, thanks. <laughs> All right, any other question? I think Orlando has a question. Orlando. All right, yes. please. Uh, hi, I want, hi to ask, I want to ask about the, uh, uh, sorry, I, I missed the beginning of your talk. I don't know, probably you, maybe you, you, you comment or not. Uh, but did you consult the matter effect on the earth? Uh, no, so for these ones, we did not because it would be like a sub, uh, an effect that is less than 10%. So we did not consider the matter effect at the earth. They would cause some module. So the net effect of the matter effect is to cause some modulation of the spectra that you see at the earth. But uh, because now you're looking at a time integrated effect, this uh, modulation would not be, it would remain within the star formation uncertainty band. So we do not consider that. Okay. Uh... Maybe, can I make another question? Yeah, sure. Uh, 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 do you have this, this atmospheric induced producing the sun? This can be a background for these uh, supernova neutrinos? Yes, so uh, atmospheric neutrinos are a background. Uh, so for most cases, these backgrounds, for example, let's look at this, so for hyper Kamiokande, the atmospheric neutrinos uh, would have a large background, but then this is mostly relevant for very high energies. For this energy, it would not be so relevant uh, because we are still focusing in energy ranges between 10 to 30 MeV. What can become important are these invisible muon backgrounds, which come from cosmic rays and then they produce uh, muons, which would not give rise to uh, Cherenkov radiations. And this background can be become much more important than the usual atmospheric neutrino background. Uh, uh, no, but I mean, talk about the atmospheric neutrinos produced not in the, in the Earth, but in the Sun. Uh, I'm sorry, you're saying atmospheric neutrinos in the Sun? Producing in the Sun, to build some, some so-called solar atmospheric neutrinos. This can be important for your background. Uh, no, so yes, so this was computed in a paper by Raphael, I think, and this is much more subdominant. This is not relevant, not not uh, compared to comparable to this background. Okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah. So these are neutrinos from the sun atmosphere. Yes. Ah, uh, okay. That's him. All right. Uh, any more questions? Pedro has a question. I have a question. Uh, 
So before the, the question, just a comment on the mass, gener mass generation. Yes. Uh, if we see a uh, disagreement between the current measurements like Katrin and cosmology measurements, that would be uh, an indication of this type of generation, right? Yes, yes. So the paper does uh, comment on that. And I mean, there are ways, so there are, uh, this is now a very interesting game. There are ways in which you can have Katrin say something and yet be consistent with cosmology by introducing exotic interactions in the neutrino sector. This would be one way, yes. Okay, and about the neutrino decay? Yes. Uh, that chi kind of square distribution that you show is regarding um, uh, how, how much time of data taking you need to get this uh, kind this of distribution. Is, this is 10 years of uh, these experiments running. 10 years? 10 years, yes. Okay, so yeah, it, it's uh, yeah, it's I mean, comparable it, it, to uh, the we, core collapse because it's a decade, right? But yeah, it's lower than the we expect for the core collapse. Uh, what do you mean by core lower than what you expect in core collapse? I mean, for galactic supernova, yeah, yeah, it, this the S and B is, all, is also core collapse, but I mean, for the galactic supernova, uh. We hope them to to occur like some percent, oh, yes. right? So yes, yes, yeah. So this is less than the that. order of decade. De decade. Yes, but uh, but the advantage is when you're going for the DSNB, this happens like one per second. So you would always have a lot of them. Okay. Okay, and ju just one last question. Yeah. Uh, do you know how collective effects could? Effect these yes. results. So collective effects are not very sensitive to this, uh, primarily because uh, let me go to this one. So collective effects cause maximum changes in this accretion phase, where there is a reasonable amount of hierarchy between the new e, the new e bar, and the new x. Yeah. But because this is a time integrated spectra, it's mostly dominated by this cooling phase. And out here, as you can see. The, the three flavors are almost hierarchic. They are almost the same. They have the same hierarchy, which is why collective effects, which even if they cause these spectral swaps, they do not really cause a big change. So it's like a change that is sub-person change. So people have looked into this, but it's not something that's very important. And because you're mostly dominated by this star formation rate uncertainty, a uh, sub-person change would not mm -hmm. really cause a big difference out here. Okay. Nice. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. I think uh, we don't have more questions. Uh, so I want to thank you um, uh, once again for your nice presentation. Thank you, you so much. That will start.